Hello everybody, Dreen Bismarck with New Life Covenant Church and welcome to the rebroadcast of Jabal International Conference 2022, The Overflow. Thank you for your patience as we took our time to edit a more perfect product for your enjoyment. We still want you to participate with the service as you would, dance if you feel like it, pray if you feel like it, take notes because each and every session we will be bringing you in these rebroadcasts is life-changing. Share this, like it, subscribe to our channels, and enjoy as the overflow continues. God bless.
Hallelujah. Everybody, join us. Let's see.
Sakangatimu Kuze Mari Wana Nemo Ya Hino Fara Tsi God, you
on, come on, come on, come on, come on. to be here and to be with you. It's been a little bit of time since we've all been together. And um, when Bishop said, would you come to be with us in Zimbabwe? I said, I will come to Zimbabwe just to see you. Everyone else can join in on our party. And I'm so glad that you did. I'm so happy to see all of your faces. 
Hallelujah. And so much is happening in the spirit. And I'm going to be, I have to kind of measure it out in tonight, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow night. But I need you to know that before you leave this place, something over your life is going to move. Hey. Yeah. We have not come through all that we have come through for nothing. And if we have learned to live on a little bit, now we are getting prepared to live on the overflow. Somebody say yes. And I'm, 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 I'm going to show you a verse here in just a moment. I, I'm, I just wanted to stand for a moment and let you know that I know when I come to Africa, I always run into so many pastors and apostles and bishops and different ones who are introduced as sons of the soil. And I tell them that I must now then be a son of the spirit. If I am not a son of the soil, then at least I can be a son of the Spirit. See. I say this to you. I'm just, I'm just sowing some things into your heart right now because it's, it's moving. I can feel it. I can feel it. And I have to tell you that Part of the kingdom is not learning, it's recognizing. You don't learn your way into the kingdom, you recognize your way into the kingdom. The people that had the most knowledge of scripture and oral tradition of the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, the ones who had the most knowledge, the doctors and the scribes and Pharisees, didn't know who Jesus was when they were looking at him. Samuel is told to go to Jesse's house and anoint a son and has never given his name because he doesn't need his name because he says, I'll know him when I see him. You don't learn your way into the kingdom. You have to know what you're looking at. I say that to tell you that you have, leading this Jabula conference, a man and a woman who are rare in the world today, and you should know what you're looking at when you look at Bishop and Pastor Tudor and Chi Chi Bismarck, and I want somebody to say amen and hallelujah for them and for their life. There's a movement happening. I'm trying to get into a message here in a minute. There's a movement happening over Harare. There's a movement happening over Zimbabwe. There's a movement happening. I don't know if you can recognize it. It's a moving. I don't know if you can feel it. If you've ever stood in, in the ocean, maybe up to your waist, and you can feel it. I feel it. There's something moving. I'm going to try to articulate some of it. Maybe in the morning, I don't know, I have to measure it out. Because it's no good to, to say something to you if, if, unless you're ready for it. Because they're, they're, the hand of God is rearranging the chess pieces. Pieces are being moved on the chessboard. I heard Bishop say, I heard Bishop say when he was before us that he was talking to us as an experienced leader. And I want to tell you something, that we have to have experienced leaders. Because we are dealing with a Jacob generation 
who are not the Abrahams who walked it out and built something out of nothing. They are not the Isaacs who are the compliant son to lay upon the altar to inherit. They are the struggling and wrestling generation. And there's a place for them. But we also have the Jacobs who are struggling and striving and competing with authority. God is bringing them through their struggles and their wrestlings. And there must be experienced leaders to help navigate some of our young leaders who are coming up quickly, but they're coming up, they're coming up separate and separated and in competition with their elders. And I hear the Lord saying he is rearranging the chess pieces on the boards. Ah, yeah. Bishop Tudor Bismarck is in a moment. I just, I just got in today. I just got in today. We haven't had time. Bishop Tudor Bismarck is in a moment. I declare unto you in the hearing of all of you, he is in a moment when you will see his elevation to a place that is bigger than pulpits, that is bigger than just messages, but it will be a status of a fathering anointing that will go broad throughout Zimbabwe and throughout Africa, but you will see it come in a weight and in a measure, and he will do in the next season. Uh. By the words of his mouth, because he is not one who has promised to be faithful, he is one who has proven to be faithful. And you will see, you will see it rise, and you will see it rise, and you will see it move things that a young man cannot move. Esau. And the Jacobs will seek him out. And some, I hear, I hear this in the spirit. I don't know enough about it to know, but I know what I know in the spirit. I know that in the spirit there are, there are those who will come even, even as, uh, uh, as they came to Jesus uh, by night, by night. The, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because, uh, because they're, 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 there's this movement of people building platforms bigger than their time. Overstepping protocols. Asa. That are not settled yet enough to know that it doesn't matter what you're driving, it's where you're going. It's not just what you're wearing, it's what you're carrying. Woo. And if you get known too early, you get known for the wrong thing. God is rearranging the chess pieces. God is moving things. God is moving things. I, 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 wanna, I, I just want to say this, and then we'll look at a scripture. When I was a young man, you made reference to Azusa. I was a... Um, one day we'll tell you the whole story. I was, the, I think, the youngest person to ever speak at Azusa, and I had to speak on a Friday night, and the person speaking Thursday night was Bishop Jakes. And when you are 29 or 30 years old, <laughs> and you have to follow Bishop Jakes, that's, I was scared. I was very scared. This is a word for someone. There's someone... There's some people under my voice that are, that are struggling to find your place because it, it, it's not that the call is not sincere, it's that, that that striving is so big. 
Somebody has to tell you. I'm going to say it out loud so everybody can hear it. You can't get there without apostolic fathering. You can't just jump your way into it. Hey. I was a young man, and Bishop tells you the truth. Is it okay to stand for a minute? I, I, I'll, I'll be done in a minute. But when Carlton asked me to come preach, I didn't find out till later that there were, you know, groups of ministers that were upset. They said, who is, you can't put that little white guy up there after Bishop Jakes. I, I'm glad I didn't know this ahead of time. I, I didn't find out till later. And so I went to Bishop Jakes' meeting, and I'm standing on the platform, and it's, you know, it's only one Thomas Dexter Jakes in the whole world. He's a, I'm sitting there, standing there while he's preaching, knowing I'm looking at history. I'm knowing he is a history maker. And I'm so excited. That's one feeling I have. The other feeling I had was, what in the world am I going to do tomorrow night? Both feelings at the same time. And he walked off the platform. Somebody needs to hear this. And he came back in, and I turned around, and he was standing there, and he reached around and grabbed me, and he pulled me very close. He's big. I'm not. He pulled me in, and he said, stand up. The world is waiting on you. <laughs> Woo! Hey! Hey! I say that to tell you that words spoken by an apostate, all of a sudden the fear left me. And that's how I got on his radar because he tracks everything. And he, they told him after it was over, VHS's cassette tapes of the messages, they said that little white guy sold more than you, any of you people did because he preached. I preached everything I knew in one time, in one time. I say that to someone who is striving to come forward. All it takes is a word from an apostolic father. You don't have to take all of your energy trying to build a platform for yourself. It's coming in God's time. Somebody say, I hear you. Those words meant something. When I was a teenager, I'm coming up on 40, 40 years I've been preaching, 40 years. And when I was a teenager, thank you, when I was a teenager... The scope of my vision was the state that I grew up in. I grew up in Ohio. And in Ohio, Ohio is the fifth largest nation, uh, state in Ohio, or in, the, in America. Ohio is the fifth largest state. I grew up in a little town that had 30,000 people in it. My wife grew up in a little town that had 15,000 people in it. And the, the scope of my vision was to buy a Volkswagen van to live in it and travel throughout Ohio and preach. That was my vision. My brother had to talk me out of it. My older brother told me, he said, don't buy that. I said, I'm going to buy it. And I would be in meetings. This is going to mean something to you. I would be in church services and people would prophesy over me and say, God's going to take you all over the, you know. And They could say to me, God's going to take you to the world and to me the world was Ohio. But today I stand in Harare, Zimbabwe. Because God is able. Somebody say, God is able. I want to read this verse, uh, this verse to you out of the book of Job. And then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll have you be seated here in just a moment. But I just wanted to just take a moment and, and greet you. And, and to say amen and God bless you name by name and face by face. I so have missed being with you so many times. And so I'm glad to see you now. Um, Job chapter 42. I want to go to the end of the book of Job. And then we'll back it up just a little bit. Um, Job chapter 42. I think someone has some verses for me. And somewhere so I can see them. Or do I need, do I need my phone or something? Where? Where? Oh, there we go. There we go. Do you know when I first started coming to Harare, I didn't have glasses. <laughs> Bishop has a picture of he and I up together in his office. And I said, look at the kid. I was a kid. 
I had hair. I had long hair. Okay. All right, here we go. Everybody ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do anything and that no thought can be taken from you. Who is he that hides counsel and, not, and, and without knowledge? Watch this. Therefore, I have, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. Therefore, I have spoken about things that I don't understand, things that are above me to be talking about, which I knew not. Here I beseech you, and I will speak. I will demand of you and declare you unto me. Watch this. Here's the verse now. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye can see. I have heard of you before, but now my eye can see. I have heard of you before. Have you ever talked to God about things that are too much for you to be saying to God? And you come to that moment where you say, I have heard of you, but now I can see. I feel like coming here tonight and talking to you about, I can see it now. I felt like the old song said, I can see clearly now, the rain is gone. I can see all the obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me bound. <laughs> Are you too saved to sing this? It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, this, this last few years, I was waiting for anything to happen. I'm, okay, I'm going to find the truthful group. These people over here are too saved. they like, no, I was saved every day. Not me. Because it seemed like you could wake up and think like anything. I was waiting for a meteor to hit the earth and zombies to come walking out. I felt like I was in an apocalyptic movie. Am I by myself? And, and Kathy and I, this November will be 38 years we've been married. 38 years. And um, yes, yes. And and she's, we're used to being busy and around people. And so, you know, when, when, when everybody, I don't know what they called it, house, I called it house arrest. <laughs> what do they call it, lockdown? Lockdown, shutdown, whatever. I called it house arrest. When they put us under house arrest in Ohio, we didn't know how long it was going to last. So for the first, you know, week or two, it was fun. The first week or two, it was fun. And my wife was like, oh, so nice. We get to, we get to be together all the time. I'm like, you, you right, boo. <laughs> and it ain't it beautiful. And we're just having fun. And we start cooking stuff. We let, let's cook something. Yeah, let's go in here. We did Facebook Live cooking. Hey, hey, saints of God, we in here cooking. Because <laughs> it was fun. Because we didn't know how long that was going to last. So for two, a couple weeks, it was fun. After two months, and I was getting Stockholm Syndrome, and, and you, you wake up, you'd be like, I, I don't even know if I should get dressed. I don't have any place to go. Ain't got no place to go. You can look at me funny if you want to. I was, I was like... I don't know what day of the week is it. Is it Tuesday or Friday? And, and it seemed like there was a, a fog. And all my life, I've heard about the goodness of God. And I have seen the goodness of God. I have heard you with my ears. It wasn't making no kind of sense. But I can see clearly now the rain is gone. 
I can see all the obstacles in my way. You can play louder than that. You know how to play. Gone are the dark clouds that had me bound. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. I'm going to explain it to you here in just a minute. Okay, come on. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Gone are the obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me bound. Come on, everybody, say, it's going to be a bright, come on, bright, sunshiny day. It's going to be a bright, bright. The devil thought he had us, didn't he? The devil thought he could take everything from us. But look at us, standing right here at Jabula Conference, baby. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunny day. Come on. It's going to be a bright, yeah. It's going to be a bright, bright. If you're glad that you made it through, you're glad that you still got breath in your body. You're glad the devil threw his best shot. But here you are with a smile on your face and a praise in your mouth. I want you to throw your hands up. Come on, one time, all across the building. I can see. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all the obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds. Gone are the dark clouds that had me bound. Come on. It's going to be a ride. Come on. Here we go. African night. It's gonna be a bright, bright, bright sunshiny day. It's gonna be a bright yeah. It's gonna be a bright, bright, bright sunshiny day. Come on, put your hand up. It's gonna be a bright. It's gonna be a bright, bright sunshiny day. It's gonna be a bright sunshine. All right, push somebody. Tell them it's going to be a bright. Come on. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. I believe it. I believe it. I said I believe it. I said I believe it. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. These guys. This team up here can make anybody sound good. The evidence of that is when our sister, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't know her name. She's famous here. Who, who, Jana? Yeah, that's what I said. And, <laughs> and you know this team can make anyone sound good because when she got done and then Bishop came up, He was like, John Baptiste, if you do, I'm going to do too. <laughs> so praise God. Praise God. I can see it. Now, can I, can I hand these to someone, please? These, uh, thank you. I was reading this verse. The, the, the book of Job, the book of Job is fascinating. Fascinating. I want, I've, it's helpful to me, hopefully to you, because it helps us navigate life. And my attempt here, just for the next little bit, is to lay this foundation for where we have the potential to be before this conference is over. And if you'll just give me the liberty to kind of work this, because I'm going to build this, I believe, tonight on, on three precepts, axioms, Presuppositions. One is the understanding of progress and process. 
Process. Everybody say process. Process. The word process is only used five times in the King James Version of the Bible. And every time that the word process is used, it is used in the same sentence structure. The word process is always used this way, and it came to pass in the process of time. Always. It takes a little time to process you. And God is in the process of processing you. And it takes a little time to understand that God does not always consult you when he's processing you. I want to build it also then maybe with that is the understanding of intentionality. That God is a God of intentionality. That he does things on purpose and for a purpose. So if the definition of process is a sequence of events that are used for forward progress, then intentionality means to me that when God is doing something, he's doing something. God doesn't do anything for no reason. And since God is intentional, whatever God does is not an end in itself, but it is for a greater process for progress. I'm coming your way. I just got to lay it out. Just got to lay it out. Walk with me for a minute because then if God is intentional, it means to me then if God is doing something, God is doing something. You may not know what he's doing, but if God is doing something, he's doing something. L let me work it out because intentionality then also teaches me that when God is not doing something, He's doing something. God is so intentional that when he's doing something, he's doing something. And he's so intentional that when he's not doing something, he's doing something. Because he is intentional. Process, intentionality. Last word, perspective. Life is a result of perspective. Perspective then teaches me that where you sit determines what you see. Where you sit determines what you see. What you see determines what you believe. And what you believe determines what you do. Perspective, even in this building, even in this building, where you are seated, gives you a different perspective than someone who is seated in a different place. Those who are behind see something different than those who are in front. Those who are in the furthest seats have the most epic view. They can see everything. Those who are over here have to, can only see me if I am in their field of vision. Where you sit determines what you see. And I, I, I want to work on that because I think that perspective is important because you can't see what I see if you don't sit where I sit. And it's difficult to get people who are not sitting with you to understand why I do what I do. Because your perspective on the thing is different than my perspective on the thing. And I've learned that it is futile to try to get you to see what I see if you won't sit where I sit. 
Yes, yes, yes. You, 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 you'll see what I mean by this because I, like many of you, are surrounded by people who are not as initiated in their faith as I am. And because I am a person of faith, then I have to understand process. And that process is a sequence of events for my progress that involves time. That God doesn't do what I want when I want. And if I'm going to walk through my journey of life in faith, I have to be okay with process. Yeah. Because I'm okay with process because I understand that my God is intentional. Uh, that he does things because he does things. And even when it doesn't appear that he's doing something, he's still doing something because he's always processing me. And because I sit in that seat by which I have become comfortable with the fact that I might sometimes be uncomfortable and I am comfortable with the fact that I don't have to have all of the statistics to support my hypothesis, I'm okay with the fact because my journey has taught me that by the time that it's over, I'm going to see it. I can't see it when it's happening, but I'm going to see it. Somebody say, I will see it. And that's why I've learned not to become too frustrated with people that don't understand my praise. You don't understand my praise because you don't understand my journey. If you understood my journey, you'd be praising God for me. If you knew what I had to go through just to be able to have a smile on my face today, don't let the fact that somebody is smiling and grinning fool you into thinking that they've always had it easy. But if you don't sit where I sit, you don't understand that I don't have time to play church games with you because my life is depending upon the fact that I've got to walk with God to get to the end of this process. I've got to walk with God to get to the end of this process. I, I'm, I'm, I, can be, I can be a little funny about it. I can be funny about it because I don't have time to support your ego. I don't have time. I don't have time to feed your attitude. I, I don't have time to get sidetracked with the fact that you're trying to mess me up. I don't have time. I will step over top of your attitude and walk all the way to the glory of God because I don't have time. I know you don't understand. I know you don't understand it, but because you don't sit where I sit, because so you can see what I see. I, I, I don't have time to get into a social media argument with you. Because you posted something that somebody should have told you not to post. I don't care. I, people were asking me, what do you think about Johnny Depp and those guys and their law? I don't care. I don't care that Will Smith smacked Chris Rock. I don't care. It was odd. It was unusual. Yes, I went, wow, that was deep. Okay, but anyway, then I got back to what my life was about. My life is not about who smacked who and who's divorcing who. That, that may involve some people's attention. You may actually care about that. You may actually have posts about that. You may actually sit at a table and discuss that. But if that's where you sit, sit where you want to sit. But he has raised me up and made me to sit in a heavenly place with Christ Jesus. 
And because when I am seated, my perspective is changed. I don't have time to get involved in your frustration. I don't have time to explain to you when you say to me, it don't take all that. You don't have to go to church on Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday morning. It don't take all that music and dancing and spinning and all that kind of stuff. You don't know what it takes for me because you don't sit where I sit. You can't see where I see. So you don't understand. You don't. You don't. You don't understand my my resolve. You don't understand the, the. You don't understand the strength of my commitment. You you don't understand why I volunteer. You don't understand why I will catch a bus down the street and then walk the rest of the way to the rainbow. You don't understand why I'm. You don't understand why I volunteer to to do whatever service that I have in the church. You don't you don't understand that because you can't see what I see because you don't sit where I sit. So I have lost my concern with trying to get uninitiated, uninformed, unintelligent people to understand why I do what I do. I do what I do because I know that I'm in process and I know God is intentional and I know that if I am seated in the right place, my perspective is going to be right. I'm going to finish this message in a minute, but I need everybody. Clap your hands and give God some praise. Right here. And I can't help but when I see you get sidetracked and derailed to wonder why you are sitting with the scornful. Mm. Yeah. You, 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 you can't ever truly understand me if you don't sit with me. I've spent my life preaching to people, and many times I sit with people because I want to understand people. I'm not trying to always get them to understand me. I want to understand them so that I might be able to help them in their process. And so I sit with people. I will, I, I will sit with sinners because sinners have a perspective of the world that is very odd to me. And I don't want to just walk up to sinners and say, you seem odd to me. So I would rather sit with them so that I can understand their perspective so that I could get them to change seats. Because once your seat is changed, what you see is based on where. You sit. And don't we all want to thank God for those who sat with us when we were having tough times and struggles and somebody cared enough rather than to lecture us, they came and they sat with us. This is the other part that I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm, I'm conscious, I'm conscious of your time. It's only going to take me like the next 27 minutes and 29 seconds. Kind of. So, so now if we go to Job chapter 1, maybe you have a, the verse for Job chapter 1. I just want to read these verses. I think I can do this. Because this is the beginning of it. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Let's do that. Okay? And it says something along the lines that there was a man named Job. Okay. It said the sons of God came to present themselves before God. Satan also came in with them. And the Lord said unto Satan... Now, this is New King James, but I'm not doing any violence to Scripture. I'm just reading into it, okay? That, that way you can see, but I'm just kind of reading into it because you have to hear the, the tone of voice. And God says to Satan, where you been? <laughs> you ever have a parent? When the parents say, where you been? A, that means you wasn't where you're supposed to be. And B, don't, don't put a lie in there right now. Because I already know. Where you been? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, you got to hear this tone in Satan's voice. Oh, i just been going to and fro across the face of the earth. <laughs> seeking whom I may devour. <laughs> All right, next verse. And the Lord said to Satan, I want you to get that. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him 
in all the earth. He's blameless, upright. He fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered in lo the Lord and said, Job is not serving you for nothing. He's serving you because you put a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the works of his hands and his possessions and have increased him in the land. Uh-huh. But now, stretch forth your hand, take that hedge down, and he will curse you to your face. Verse 12, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Just don't touch him. Here I come. If you don't understand process, if you don't understand the intentionality of God, if you don't understand where Job is sitting, and you can't sit with Job, you're going to have the wrong perspective on this whole thing. This is this because, because you have to know this is the kind of thing that doesn't make any kind of sense. Something is going on in Job's life that he is unaware of. Job hasn't done anything. Job is just being Job. Job gets up one day doing all the Jobiness jobs that Job Job. I feel like it should be some kind of a rap or a rhyme up in there. Job is just jobing it. That's going to be my new one. How you doing? I'm jobing it. I'm just jobing it. Job just gets up and he's jobing it. Like he always did. Not knowing that a conversation is being had about him. That he's not aware of. And so he just gets up. Starts Job in his day, and God and Satan are having this conversation. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless, upright, the greatest man in the East. Have you ever had God single you out for something when you want to be left alone? Job's not trying to be a target. He's not trying to be the evidence. He ain't trying to be strong. He's just Job. And this, is, this, is, this is the thing. Satan says to God, here we go. God does not say to Satan. Satan says to God. Mm, you got to get it. God does not say this to Satan. Satan says to God, Job's not serving you for nothing. He's serving you because you put a hedge around him. You bring that hedge down, and he'll curse you to your face. God didn't say it. Satan said it. No, you, you, you catch me. In about, in about 15 seconds, you're going to remodel this place. It's, it, it, you, it's going to be so, you're going to get it. And then you're going to just, you're going to jump up here and join the choir or something. Huh. Because, uh, here we go. You're on the countdown now. You got about 10 seconds. Here come the countdown. God never brought up the word hedge. You're going to have to help me. I'm in E-flat. 
Satan brought up the word hedge, which means while he was going to and fro across the earth, he accidentally bumped into something one day. And when he got over to Job's house, he hit something. And he said, I know what that is. That's not by might. That's not by power. But God has put a hedge around Job and everything that Job had. Your 10 seconds is almost up. You can praise God for your car if you want to. I want to thank God for a hedge. You can thank God for the clothes on your back. I want to thank God for the hedge. I think right here on this Saturday night, uh, somebody ought to give God a hedge praise. Somebody ought to thank God for the times the devil tried to take you out, uh, but he ran into a hedge. The hedge was so strong, uh, you didn't even know it was operating. You was just jobing it out. You were just walking it out. Uh, but the devil ran into a hedge. I came here to Harare, Zimbabwe uh, to say thank God for the hedge. See us. See us. See us. See us. God is so good at putting a hedge up around you that you were protected when you didn't even know you were protected. Uh, things was falling all around you. Demons was going all around you. But God saved you uh, because he put a hedge around you. Everybody ought to clap your hands and give God praise for the hedge. Well, here's the thing. By the way, that part is not off my preaching time. So the thing, see, the thing is that now, now Job, Job doesn't know this is going on. God didn't bring up hedge. The devil brought up hedge. The devil said, you, now he's going to question Job's character. You, Job, Job ain't all what you're trying to make him out to be. You act like Job is blameless and righteous and sanctified and fueled the Holy Ghost and that mighty burning fire. Been baptized in Jesus' name only and only. Oh, Job ain't serving you for nothing. Job is just serving you because you put that hedge around See, see, now the enemy is questioning your character. Huh. Sometimes you think you're going through a test when God has already seen you pass the test. Because it was God that brought up Job's name. No, 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 you missed it, you missed it. The devil brought up the hedge, but it was God that brought up Job. God brought up Job because he knew the devil would bring up the hedge to question the character of Job, but God already knew Job, and he said, fine, I'm going to take the hedge down. I'm going to give you permission with a limit. I'm going to give you permission. Y'all didn't hear me. I'm going to give you permission with a limit. I'm going to give you permission with a limit oh, oh. because the devil thinks okay hang on hang on hang on the devil thinks that if you let that hedge come down here's here's what he says job will curse you to your face and i can hear god saying please you don't know job like i know job so just to embarrass you, I'm going to bring the hedge down 
and give you permission with a limit. Just don't touch him. This is all great for us. Because we're seated here. Job has no idea what is going on around him. He's just jobing it, jobing it, jobing it. Right? Doing his thing. Getting up, offering sacrifices, seeking God, doing his thing. People say, Job, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Job is jobing it. He's just happy. Job doesn't understand why his three friends, Milk Dud and Doodad and whatever, and three guys, whatever the three stooges names, his three friends, he didn't know. He didn't. I'm sorry, it's jet lag. You can't understand my message unless you sat where I sat for 14 and a half hours. And so, so, so Job, Job is just doing his thing. All of a sudden, fire, house gone, kids gone, livestock gone. I mean, it's just boom, 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 boom. I'm coming your direction. And Job now is like, what? is going on. Have I located you? There we are under house arrest. School shut down. You trying to act like you love your kids? You <laughs> and you're like, my God, open up schools. Forget the windows of heaven, open a school. I rebuke these little devourers. And you love them. You love them, but you're tired of them. Plus, you ain't going to work. They didn't shut jobs down. And lockdown. And it's too much time, too much face space. Sometimes wives will be like, you know, this would be a good time for us maybe to talk. I'm like, you must be, no, the devil is a lie. Loose here, Satan. You know, and uh, I'm like, no, that's, I'm good. I'm good because they make this thing called Netflix. I watch everything on Netflix. And, and so it was Job's wife. Sorry, ladies, sorry, all the ladies. I know it's a thing, but it just, in this story, in this story, just Hey, I didn't write it. I didn't write the story. I'm just telling you the way it went down. What had happened was that Job's wife, she said, sorry, hey, sorry. Job's wife said, you ought to curse God and die. Now, just for a point of clarification, if you're going to die, last thing you want to do I'm just saying, on the way out, let a praise be in your mouth. God, I don't understand it. I think I'm fixing to die. He cut up. You don't want a curse in your mouth on the way out. And, and Job's, see, this is important. This is important. You've got to be careful who's around you when you're in process. Because some people will say to you the same thing that the devil is saying to you. And the devil had already said, I'm going to get him to curse God to his face. And now somebody close to him says, you should just curse God. Because other people don't know the internal dialogue you're facing when every demon in hell is telling you you ought to just give up. All that thing that you were, you tried to start a business, then they locked it down, and, and then you done it, and every you try to start that church, and then they snatch it down. And the, the, they don't know that you're fighting for everything you have, and here they come walking up on you going, you should just quit. And if that wasn't enough, 
Here come his three friends. Here come the three friends. And they say, uh, you must have done something. I mean, you had to do something. Come on. Come on. You had to do something. All these people so smart. You had to do something. You so smart. What was it? Tell me what I did so I can fix it. You had to do something. I mean, my God, man. <laughs> Yesterday, you was the wealthiest man in the East. One day later, whoo, fire's down. Next day, your cattle's gone. Whoo, your kids are gone. Lost everything in three days. My God, you did something. And Job says, the Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name. Woo. Job had enough sense to know that being the greatest man in the East does not exempt you from trouble. How dare you look at somebody going through trouble as if they must have done something. You better be careful because you keep sowing that you're going to grow it. You sitting up there looking at somebody else because you don't sit where they sit. You can't see what they see. And because you don't know God is intentional, you don't, you don't know that God is doing something because he's doing something. And he just has Job in the process of doing something. This is going to take a little time. Job works it out. He starts talking to God. I don't know if you've ever had one of these conversations with God that go like, it's, it's you talking, not God. You, you're the one doing the talking. And you're telling God all your frustrations. I don't know if you ever had that. It's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations. It's a whole book. If you run out of stuff to complain, just start reading Lamentations. And then, and then, you know, and Jeremiah did it one time. Jeremiah told God, everything in my life was fine. You prevailed upon me because you're stronger than me. And, and you pushed me. You made me do it my whole life all apart. But it's like fire shot in my bones. <laughs> David starts complaining. How are they increased that trouble me? God, you don't see these people doing this? Can't you kill somebody? You, you may not have those kind of conversations with God, but I will, I will tell you. I will, I will tell you. Let me, I, I'm going to make my confession of faith. Let me, I will tell you before God <laughs> that there are, there are times I told God, I know you see them. I know you see them. I know you see them. I know you know where they live. And just a clue, they ain't got no blood on the doorpost of that house. If you want to go up in there, and if you don't want to go up in there, I know people. I know some people that will go up in there for a Starbucks. I'm getting you to the overflow. I'm on an assignment. I don't know if you know this. I'm on an assignment that I can't get you to the overflow because something is blocking your overflow. And it's because nobody ever taught you how to process pain. And the truth of the matter is it hurts. It hurts when your life gets locked down. It hurts when your job gets snatched. It hurts when, the, when your kids get behind in school. It hurts when your family members struggle. It hurts. All of us lost friends and people that were close to us and family members. And there was a lot of loss in the last few years. And I was telling God about it. Thank you. I'm just the one to be out here by myself. <laughs> and I, t I was telling you, you know how you tell God, God doesn't make it, no kind of sense, you know? And, and nobody taught us that, that God can handle it. You guys know that. You read the middle part of the book of Job, and Job's telling God all this and all that, and going this and that, you know? And, but what, what nobody really prepared us for is that you can't get through life without pain. We don't, we're not even allowed to talk about it in some of our churches. 
So I have to come and I have to smile at you. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even know to pray for me. Because I'm so busy not wanting you to think less of me. So I smile when I, when I don't feel like it. And our men are suffering in silence. By the time a man tells you he's in trouble, he's already going under for the third time. Ladies will tell each other, they got, they got prayer chains and stuff. <laughs> men ain't on no prayer chain. What's a prayer chain? I got a prayer noose. Ladies got prayer chains. They, they in trouble. Everybody knows it. Everybody know it. But my thing is we don't talk about pain, but you can't. Truth, truth, truth. We can't get through life without pain, but nobody ever told us how to process our pain. And there's no such thing as an unexpressed emotion. If you feel it, it's coming out somewhere. And people act like they're surprised that, that during lockdowns, Alcoholism went through the roof and drug addiction went through the roof and domestic violence went through the roof and child abuse went through the roof and we, we act like, well, where, did, where did that come from? Because nobody ever told us what to do with our pain. I love the song that we were singing where it talks about us rolling it over on the Lord. But that's easier sung than done when you can't sleep and you're walking the floor and your brain is racing and you're walking and you can't make sense out of nothing and your patterns are thrown off and your days are thrown off your schedules are thrown off everything is thrown off and you're a pastor and you don't even know who really is a part of your church anymore because when they could come back they don't come back but they got pictures all over social media. That's then they at the mall, they're in the concert, they're at the beach, they're on vacation. How come you don't come to church? I don't feel safe. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. And, and all of this thing. And the truth is, it hurts. I don't, I don't know why we have to make that differently. This is my assignment for tonight. I, I, I'm, I'm done in three minutes and 14 seconds. I, I, I'm done. I'm, I'm done because when I, when in, in, I'm on an assignment for my brothers and my sisters because we're talking about overflow, but sometimes what hinders us from really getting to our overflow is we have to go through the process of dealing with our pain. I can't just skip on and act like that didn't bother me. I can't act like I'm made of steel and you can say anything you want about me and it didn't hurt my feelings. I know, I know, I know I'm a grown man. I got three grandkids. But it hurt my feelings when you lied on me because you know I won't tell the truth on you. Since I'm a pastor, I won't tell the truth on you because you came to me in confidence, but then you lied on me. It hurt you when, you when you took money that you had put back in faith and praying and you did, this and did that and you had confession. You got scriptures all over your house and then you started that business and whoosh, locked down. That hurt. Made you question stuff. I came to tell you that the devil is trying to knock you out by wearing you down. And when you get wore down, he's going to try to knock you out. Because you didn't know that your work is supposed to come out of your rest. You're not supposed to work to rest. That's why God made man on the sixth day so that the first day the man would walk into would be the day of rest so that out of his rest would come his labor. And now you're just running and working. You're just running and working and you're running and working and now you're tired and hurt and you make bad decisions when you're tired and you make bad decisions when you're angry and you make bad decisions when you don't feel good. You make bad decisions when you can't get no rest and can't get no sleep and you're upset about everything. And then you come to church and you got to grin at somebody who just got a miracle.
I said it that way because that's how, that's the tone that's inside your head. When you're about ready to go, you just think you're, you're going to explode. Take everything you got just to make it. And somebody come walking up to you, oh my God, I got to tell you about this miracle. Three angels showed up at my house last night, boom. They left, it was a big pile of gold bricks. And in your head, you're like, if I could grab one of them gold bricks, I'd bust you in the head with one right now. I'd just hit you in the head with a gold brick. Glad you got your miracle. <laughs> Nobody lets us process our pain. Nobody told us all, all change is painful. Mm. I can't wait till I get married. Painful. We get ready to have our first baby. That's like 18 years of pain. All growth is painful. It don't make it bad. It's just painful. Okay, so I'm off the clock now. So when I'm off the platform on time. I'm still safe. I jumped off just in time. I'm going to wrestle this devil down because it's your pain that's blocking your overflow. And I came tonight because tonight we're going to get rid of the pain and we're going to go to the overflow. I couldn't see it. Couldn't see what was happening. My, my wife and I, we were, we were kids when we got married. We were young. We were young. And we're talking about, let's have, you know, a baby. Let's have a baby, you know. And I'm like, I'm just going along. <laughs> you know. And, and so I grew up in a time, I don't, know, I don't know what the cultural things are, but I grew up in a time like where men, like my father and the, his father before him, they, they, were, they did not go into no birthing rooms. You'd be lucky if they took you to the hospital. <laughs> Call me when it's over. It wasn't all this weird pregnant. You know what I'm talking about? Like, young people, young people be like, we're pregnant. Every time they do, I just smile at them. Because I love y'all. I love y'all young people. That's beautiful. Y'all pregnant. <laughs> you know that. And I don't care. You're the, you're the wife. You can say it all you want to. Like, hey, we're, we're pregnant. You know good. Look, just hang, on, hang around about nine months. You're going to find out who's pregnant. That man ain't nowhere close to being pregnant. He might gain weight with you. He might sit up with you. And then we had, you know, they had them little movements that go through the church every so often where the ladies talk about like, you know, well, pain is a sign of the curse. And so I bind up that curse. That's always people that ain't had no kids. Anyway, so my wife and I, we we're young, real young. And so... They, had, they started them, they, it's, they complicate everything. Now it's, it's Lamaze, Lamaze classes. Do y'all know about Lamaze classes? My, my wife knows me. She's like, she didn't even sign me up for it. I'm not going to no Lamaze classes. <laughs> Teach you how to breathe. God taught you how to breathe. <laughs> Let everything that have breath. Praise the Lord. I got verses for you, baby. <laughs> you need me up there talking about, look, people have been having babies for eons without my help. You'll be all right. <laughs> Trust God. <laughs> you know, anyway, so she got one of her best friends, you know, one of her lady friends. They're going to the Lamar's classes. And so, you know, because I'm, I'm going to go to the hospital, but I feel like I need to be all up in the room. I can't, no, no, seriously, I can't help you. That's all I'm saying. I love, look, I love you. My role starts when, when you come home with the baby. All the ladies in here are mad. No, I bind it in the name. <laughs> Lucia, Satan. Okay, I got to quit. We got church in the morning. So, but my point is, my point is, you know, my wife decided and that, um, you know, she, she's a first-time mom and she's studying and, you know, books and, you know, all the whatever. Scriptures all on the mirrors and, you know, all that. And, and um, so she says, I'm going to do uh, no drugs, uh, uh, natural, what is that, what, natural childbirth? 
No drugs. I'm like, you go, girl. <laughs> I'm like, what am I supposed to say? I'm like, you go. You go. You take all that Lamaze stuff and you work it. You work that Lamaze. So, so we go up in there and my wife's mother, who's, who is alive, she's an angel. Jeanette, my mother-in-law, she likes me. I, I met her before I met Kathy. And she told Kathy, if you don't marry this one, you can't marry nobody. <laughs> me and Jeanette been tight ever since. Yes, yes, amen. Jeanette's an angel. So Kathy's over there, you know, and they have that little uh, seismograph over there so you can tell when the earthquakes are hitting, the, the meter. And so Kathy's over there having the baby, and every so often it'd be like a little, I could see the meter, beep, like this. And Kathy'd be like, ooh, you know, like, like a little contraction thing. And Jeanette's sitting there with her Bible over top of her, just reading verses, you know. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. I mean, it's a whole, it's like a movie. It's going on. I'm just looking at it. Because I'm there, and all of a sudden, that machine switched up. And it was just kind of like, and smoke coming up out of it. I don't know, it's like a major contraction. And Kathy went, ah, like that. And then it's like, and the, the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. And Kathy, Kathy, I saw a face I had never seen. She looked at her mother. She said, get that Bible away from me. I was like, oh, the room got cold and dark. I was like, it's time for me to go. Something is off. Something is off. And... Kathy is probably home watching right now. Baby, you know I love you. It's 39, 38 years in November, but I'm telling the story because you know what happened. <laughs> so all of a sudden, Kathy says, Kathy says to the nurse, she said, um, I need some drugs. <laughs> and the nurse said to Kathy, baby, it's too late now. You know, like you get to a certain part, they won't, they won't give you any. She didn't cross that line. And she said, the nurse said, oh, baby, it's too late now. We can't give you now. I said, bring them to me. <laughs> Somebody in this room got to have some drugs. I can't go through this without some drugs. Somebody better give me a shot. Somebody better go get some crack or something. Do something. I can't sit here and go through this without some drugs. I'm going to pray deliverance for every addict. Don't worry about it. I'm just telling a story. Anyway, how did I get off? My point is, you can't have a baby without pain. You can't go from high school into university without pain. You can't go from level to level without pain. And here's the point. Here's the point. The point, the Bible says it this way. And God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Because forgiveness is the work of a healed heart. And when you get healed, you can forgive. See, all, some of our forgiveness, I'm done. I'm going to play something to seem like I'm getting ready to stop. Just easy stuff. Healing music. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we forgive because we're supposed to. Right? We know that. We know that. I'm just talking real talk here. We, we do that. We... We, 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 we even start mess, more trouble, when we forgive people because we don't really forgive them. And we say it like that. I forgive you. They didn't even ask for it. You know, I forgive you. For all, and then we text people, I forgive you. 
for, for, for the lies you told on me, for the way you stabbed me in my back. I still forgive you. And then we put that little, God bless you. <laughs> Have a nice day. But we didn't really forgive. We just did because we never processed the pain. And forgiveness is the work of a healed heart. And it's possible to be upset with God and you don't know how to process it. You tell God it don't make no sense, didn't never make no sense, it don't make no sense. Will never make no sense. But my faith has taught me that it don't make sense while it's happening, but there's a process. And because God is intentional, that he's not doing anything for nothing. He's doing something when he's doing something. And because of where I sit, I see it differently than what somebody sitting on the outside. You may not understand my praise in the midst of my pain. You may not understand it, but here's what I came to tell somebody. When Job got to the end of it, he was able to look up at God and said, you know, you got to forgive me because I was talking about stuff I didn't know anything about. I had heard about your greatness, but now I can see it myself. And I came to tell somebody you've been through hell and high water. The devil tried to take you out. It didn't make no sense to nobody around you. But God is about ready to give you double for your trouble. And if you believe it, you ought to stand up on your feet right here and throw your hands straight up in the air. Are you E flat? E flat? And hold that hand straight up in the air. Cause I can see clearly now the rain is gone gone are the dark clouds in my way gone are the dark clouds that had me bound it's gonna be a bright bright sunshiny day see it's okay to say I didn't understand it when it was happening. And I came here tonight to say some of the things that are holding you, some of the things that feel like chains around your feet, some of the things that have been like stones and sand stuck down in your well is because never, nobody ever told you that God is near to the brokenhearted and that God has a way of turning sorrow into joy he has a way of giving you twice what the enemy took from you because God never doubted you God always had confidence that you weren't going to give up that you weren't going to quit and you came right to the edge of it and everything in your environment said curse God and die give up throw in the towel quit serving him do your thing but look at you on a Saturday night standing right here in the house of God I came to tell you that you are about ready to live in the overflow Because you learn how to say, my heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you and I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled. That's why my heart is filled. That's why my heart is filled with praise. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I came to lift you up. And I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled today, right now. That's why my heart is filled. Nobody else could see it, but God was holding me together. 
That's why my heart is filled with praise. Somebody's here tonight and the only thing that held you together was God. It wasn't because you were great. It wasn't because you always had a praise in your mouth. It wasn't because you always did all the right things. You were this close to giving up, throwing in the towel, walking out on God. But you held on, you held on. And I came to tell somebody tonight that the God that you serve is intentional. The God that you serve is taking you through a process. And God has given you a perspective that the enemy won't ever be able to hit you that way, hurt you that way, or take nothing else from you. Because from this day forward, you are in a process of progress, successive events, taking you into your double portion season. One more time, clap your hands and give God praise all over this house. All over the building, hold your hands up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Bishop, 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 my friend, my brother, I'm on an assignment. I'm on an assignment. And part of my assignment is you. I came to tell you that when you didn't understand anything, couldn't navigate through everything that God was doing something when he was doing something and he was doing something when he wasn't doing something and the process just play just and the process gives you a perspective this may, may not make sense to anybody else but when I when I heard and saw earlier that these people will witness to see your enlargement and your elevation that is bigger than just pulpits. I saw it as an apostolic father moving throughout this territory. I saw it just, I don't even know how to define it, but you'll know it when you see it. You're seeing it unfold in front of you. And it doesn't make sense where anybody else is sitting, but sometimes the breaking of your heart with your own son that nobody may have known gives you a perspective as an apostolic father and God will add to you many more sons that are coming into your life. And it, does, it doesn't make our pain less. Somebody needs to tell you you're allowed to hurt. You're a human being. You're allowed to cry. You're allowed to. Huh. But God, but God held you together. And I come against every assignment of the enemy against you and your house, against dream, against all of your family. The assignment that while you were holding other people together, God had to hold you together. And you were praying for other people when nobody was praying like they could for you. Huh. Wiping tears out of your own eyes in back rooms and on front rows to stand up and preach faith to other people. I declare to you, my friend and my brother, your big days of double are coming upon you. And God's going to make the devil pay. Because God is right ready, right here. Right here. I said right here and right now, God is getting ready to turn your captivity. And what the enemy meant for your evil, God is getting ready to turn for your good. I need everybody that believes that to throw your hands up, open up your mouth and shout yes. Yes, 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 yes. Whew. I'm trying so hard to sit down, but I got to tell you, there are people that tonight, the strength of addiction is being broken over your life because it's rooted in pain. It's rooted in pain. It's rooted in pain. 
If the Lord says the same, I believe on Sunday night, we're going to have time to just, I'm talking about lay hands, cast devils out, break assignments, everything. Because right now, God is digging into it. God is digging into it. And your pain is getting ready to leave. Your pain is getting ready to leave. One time, hold your hands up. i got to pray for you. I'm, I'm praying all over this building, all over this territory, that you couldn't see it. Said things you wouldn't have said if you had seen it. But you can see it. You can see it now that things are turning. You made a way. When my back was against the wall And it seemed as if it was over You made a, a way And I'm standing here Only because you made a way You made a way when my back was against the wall and it seemed as if it was over but you made a way somebody knows it and i'm standing here only because you and i'm standing here and i'm standing here come on throw your hand up and say and I'm standing here, and I'm standing here, only because you made a way. Because you move mountains, you call.
There's a gentleman right there. You have on green and black? Right here? Are you by yourself? Oh, this group? You came here. I won't get started prophesying tonight because I, will, I won't be able to sit down. But there, you came here for a word. I can hear it. You told God, I got to have a word at this conference. So you told God, I got to have a word. And I hear the Lord saying that your time is in front of you and it's as if birthing is coming. And, and it's interesting because, <laughs> because the thing is, the frustration has been because of what is in you is not what is matching what's on the outside of you. But you can't let go of what's on the inside of you, even though it doesn't match what's on the outside of you. God is about ready to help you because what he's doing is proving you. I don't know what kind of prophecies you're used to getting, but I gotta, I'm telling you, God is proving you and testing you because he has to, he's watching you. He's watching how you respond to people who are, it seems as if they're going faster. He's, he's watching you by seeing, can you keep a good spirit? He's watching you by seeing how you're managing the behind the scenes. He's watching you. And you said, God, I need a word when I come to Jabula. You just got a word because you're pregnant and it's gonna cost you a little bit of pain, but get ready, get ready, get ready because that baby is on the way. Somebody ought to say something right here. Hey! You move mountains. You cause walls to fall with your power. There's nothing It's impossible It's impossible Only because Only because you made Okay Here's what I know Here's what I know I'm going to preach in the morning It's going to be ridiculous Okay, you don't have to believe me but I'm just telling you, I ain't in no Volkswagen van. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a whole nother world. And then tomorrow night, tomorrow night, whoo, I'm just saying. I'm just, but here's, here, here, here's my assignment. I learned a long time ago what opens up an atmosphere, preachers hear me, what opens up an atmosphere is not something's depth, it's its accuracy. When you say on earth what God is saying over a people, then the heavens open up. And I want to, I want I know how to preach a conference happy message or run message or something. I believe in all that. But I knew I was on assignment. And the assignment is that you can talk and sing overflow all you want to. And until you deal with that pain, it's going to block your overflow. And that I was here to strengthen the hands of my brother. And to let him know the devil thought he had you wounded. Because here's the, here's the key, everybody. The reason Job's friends said what they said, because if the devil can rob you of your faith, he can take from you what you need to recover. And I came to announce to somebody, you have an appointment with recovery. And you get ready to recover. And you ought to tell somebody, I'm going to recover. If you don't recover with me, I'm going to recover. I've been fighting too long. I will recover. I will pursue. I will overtake. I will recover it all. I have an appointment with recovery. I'm getting me a recovery t-shirt. I'm going to have a recovery party at my house. I'm going to get me a recovery cell group. I'm going to write a song called Recovery. I have an appointment with recovery. Tonight, I don't, know, I don't know the best way to do this, but I do know that tonight, many people, I know there's electronic giving and I think that we can do that, but here's, here's what I want to tell you. I want, I want you to hear me when I tell you. When you're not in recovery, 
and everything is, then everything goes in, right? All of us here have had a, had a feel sorry for yourself day or pity party, you know, and you just, it all goes in here. You start talking about who don't like you, or who did you wrong, and who, all the, all the wounds, right? I know you don't want to say amen because they, they're close to you, but, but you talked about them and he was holding it all in. And what I had to learn to teach people was that some people get comfort from entertaining those spirits and it becomes your friend and it sits with you and comforts you and it's a demonic spirit trying to hold you in place and you have to break agreement with that thing and you have to begin to sow into your future so everybody that can <coughs> Dreen or somebody may have to give some kind of directions but everybody that can should bring an offering down and lay it in one of these buckets or on the altar as your seed, your recovery seed, your recovery seed. And if you don't have a recovery seed that way and you're doing it electronically, then how, how did y'all, I don't know whether y'all put them up on screens or whatever. You guys know how to do it, right? Look here. You use your phone for everything else. So this is your moment to use your phone and sanctify it for just a minute. Let your phone speak for you. And you can say to yourself, somebody ought to text to yourself. Somebody ought to take a selfie and put it on all over social media. Did I say, I am recovering. I have an appointment with recovery. I will recover. I will pursue. I will overtake. I will recover it all. So whether if you're getting your phone out, do it. Everybody, everywhere, if you're bringing it, bring it right now. I'm going to see you in the morning. Who's, who's closing the service, Dreen or Bishop? Who's coming? Somebody's coming. But you move mountains. I'm going to sing with the choir. You cause the walls to fall with your power. You perform a miracle. Perform a miracle. There is nothing. There is nothing. That's impossible. That's impossible. You will recover. You will recover. You will recover. Wow, wow, wow. What an incredible, incredible service. We want to thank you for watching this rebroadcast of Jabale International Conference 2022, The Overflow. What an incredible, incredible session. And it was one of so many that blessed people. We thank you for being patient with us as we put this program up. Again, please share this message with somebody. Like, subscribe to all of our channels, New Life Covenant Church and Tudor Bismarck Ministries. And also thank you for your donations, your giving. Your contributions to our ministry is what makes Jabula Conference and everything else we're doing as New Life Covenant Church and Jabula International possible. You reap the benefits of your sowing and we are able to do the work of the Kingdom of God. We want to thank you. God bless you and we'll see you again.